Hello, welcome to the Charity Impact Podcast, where our purpose is to learn more about how effective charities and individuals achieve social change or social impact. I'm your host, Alex Blake, and this podcast is brought to you by Akida Consulting, where I help charities to develop strategy, secure funding, and navigate a range of challenges and opportunities. I'd love to hear what you think about the podcast. Please do leave a review on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, etc., or tag me in a post on LinkedIn or Twitter using at AlexBlake underscore K-E-D-A, or drop me an email to hello at kedaconsulting.co.uk. For details on all episodes with notes and links to resources, head to our website, kedaconsulting.co.uk. In today's episode, I talked to Chris Sherwood, CEO of RSPCA, about Chris's personal experience of working in the charity sector, including living with epilepsy, having a working class background and experience in homophobia. We discuss innovation and service improvement, organisational change, governance, strategy development and professional development. Despite being only around 40 years old, Chris has been Chief Exec at the RSPCA since August 2018 and previously Chief Exec at Relate for three years, having been their Director of Policy, Comms and Digital Services before that. Previously, he's been Director of Innovation and Development at Scope, Senior Development Manager at Nesta, where he led on their work on co-production, people-powered health and ageing. And Chris also worked in services in local government while studying for his degree. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. How are you today? Good morning, Alex. I'm great. The sun is shining in East London. It's a it's a lovely start to an autumn day. How are you doing today? Uh, yeah, likewise. It is actually a beautifully clear day up in Newcastle today. Lovely, clear, sunny, crisp, fresh, <laughs> a little bit chilly. Well, let's hope it stays that way tomorrow because I'm in the northeast tomorrow, so I hope it's nice and sunny then. <laughs> oh, are you? Uh, whereabouts are you going? I'm visiting two of our animal centres, one on Teesside and then one in County Durham. Cool. Just slightly south of me. It's nice. I'm hoping it's uh, worth a like this for Halloween for the kids. <laughs> I've got outdoorsy stuff today. Okay, so first question is just, can you tell us a bit about your background and what motivated you to begin a career in social impact? Great. Thanks for inviting me onto your podcast, Alex. It's a real, it's a real pleasure and privilege to, to be invited to be interviewed. So thank you. So I, I grew up in Corby in Northamptonshire, which I grew up in, you know, I was sort of born in 1918, grew up in the 80s and sort of time of deindustrialization. So Corby had been a, a steel town and the steelworks were closed down in the early 80s, uh, which resulted in real mass unemployment in, in my town. Um, and it's a really interesting town, Corby, because most of the population can trace their roots back to Ireland, to Scotland and to Wales, because it was a village um, at the beginning of the 20th century and then through mass migration became a kind of steel town. So my family was quite unique in that we're not actually Scottish. <laughs> my next door neighbours used to run the bagpipe band in Corby and I grew up with lots of kind of Scottish cuisine from iron brew through to Scotch bread as well. And I do love a macaroon bar. Um, when, when I grew up, you know, I did, the only white collar role I knew was a teacher. My dad was a dustbin man and a gardener for the local authority. And my mum was a cleaner for the local authority. And she used to clean kind of bars when I was a kid as well. So we'd spend summer holidays running around uh, this uh, social club <laughs> with my sister because uh, we couldn't afford childcare. Um, so you know, I, I, the only role I knew was to be a teacher. And that's what I sort of set my hopes on was to become a teacher. And I was fortunate to do a gap year as a youth and children's worker. Um, down in Devon and then realised quite quickly that I didn't want to be a teacher but I moved from a very working class community I grew up in a council estate in Corby through to a really wealthy part of Plymouth uh, which was a real kind of culture shock really um, for me it was a very different culture to the one I lived in but it did open up the possibilities of other roles and that's when I decided through clearing to not go and be a teacher but to apply to Exeter where I read history and that was a, a fantastic opportunity <laughs> but I was I was a bit of a kind of hippie student, so I used to wear sort of tie-dye and linen trousers and, you know, was listening to the levelers at the time and really interested in kind of uh, politics. Uh, I was a bit of a fish out of water, to use an animal phrase, uh, at Exeter. Um, but it did set me on the path that I, I'm on now. And I, because we had no money as a, as a, when I was a student, you know, my parents couldn't financially support me. And I didn't always have the best relationship with them either. I sort of worked my way through university and I started working for social services. And that's really what sort of set me on the kind of career path I am today. And I think what sort of motivated me, you know, to work in, in the sort of charity sector is, Growing up in the town that I did, I saw lots of possibilities, of potential of people. 
that we're just hampered by barriers in society. And I always had that sort of phrase of it's not right and it could be better, it could be different. And it's really motivated me to, to think about how I can use my life, my career to make a difference for others in society. So that kind of social justice principles are really developed from me as a, as a kind of where I grew up in, in Corby and, and when I sort of transitioned into university, really. So that's why I sort of set my path on a career in, in, in civil society, really. Just a quick kind of side question. So you moved to Plymouth. That was before kind of thinking about going to Exeter, Exeter Uni, which is down that way. So what was the, like, how did that kind of move come about? Was that, did you kind of get the job down there and then go down for the gap year? So I got, I, I did a gap year at 18. I mean, Plymouth and Corby is not the most exciting kind of, I mean, Plymouth's a great city, by the way. I love Plymouth and I love Corby, but, you know, I didn't kind of go off and do, I don't know, trekking around Kenya or something. But for me, when I grew up, I'd only, I'd barely left my hometown, really, when I grew up. I think I'd been to France on a school trip once. That was the only time I'd been abroad by the time I was 18. I'd been to London maybe twice. So going to Plymouth and jumping on a, a train was a really scary thing for me as a sort of 18 year old. And I went to do a gap year as a working in a kind of youth centre in Plymouth as a youth and children's worker. And so I'd sort of seen the opportunity when I was doing my A-levels and just thought, I'm going to give this a go and apply. And I think it was my way of kind of, because, you know, for the, the focus of me, as we've talked before, is was around education. I wanted to, to kind of be able to move on and do good things in my life. And I knew education was a really key route to do that. But I think at 18, going to university straight from the background I had would have been a really scary proposition. And so doing the gap year felt was still pretty scary for me, but less scary than it than it would have been, really. So that's that's what I did. Because I, I just didn't have, like, I knew one person in my kind of friendship group who was at university, and I went to visit her for a weekend, and she was at Canterbury Christchurch. So I just decided to apply to Canterbury Christchurch to teach a training because I'd been there. And, and it, you know, I haven't really sort of reflected much on that, but it was it was that kind of stepping into the unknown you know I didn't really have a roadmap that I was following but I knew I wanted to do something so yeah applying for the gap year was a was a kind of stepping stone to university yeah it's interesting there's two things that strike me there one is kind of impressed and intrigued by the sort of self-awareness that you had to think that's going to be like a big step going straight into uni so I'm going to go and do the gap year because I know when I went off to uni it was like Really, I was like nowhere near mature enough to be, to just go away and like manage my own sort of time and money and all the rest of it. So yeah, that's interesting. And then the other thing was just picking up on that stuff you've talked about, kind of working class background and the feeling some of the difference between that background and then a lot of people in leadership positions in the sector being in being from kind of more middle class or upper class backgrounds and things. And it's interesting that kind of, I suppose, some of those experiences around travel and things like that, and that just kind of, for people from wealthier backgrounds, kind of it being a thing to just go up. Like if you want to do a gap year, you, as you say, you'd go off and trek around Kenya or wherever, or, you know, whatever kind of global trip. And then for lots of working class people, it is like just going to the next city along is like a big deal. You know, like there are lots of people up here you know people who live in Gateshead that have never been to Newcastle they've never been across the bridge kind of thing um, and it's just a completely different uh, it's an interesting thing about the mindset in terms of like what's possible feeling like you kind of have the opportunity to do whatever you want versus feeling this is your kind of play you know this is the town you stay in that town and do the thing that probably your dad and your granddad have done and that sort of thing so it brings me on to the next question, which was linked to the interview you did with Civil Society, which I was reading recently. You talked about that difference in class, difference looking at kind of previous leadership, people in leadership positions, also experience of kind of different forms of discrimination, experience in homophobia in the sector. So, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to hear about that and if you, if you still experience forms of discrimination now or like how that's kind of changed over time and, and now that you are in one of those leadership positions and as chief exec of a, a large 200 year old charity kind of second second question really kind of completely separate question then is you know at 
the RSPCA, what's your approach to diversity and inclusion and trying to make sure that things are inclusive for your workforce and volunteers and you know, everyone who comes through the doors? Right. Thanks for the question. That's a really good question. Maybe kind of three questions in one. So feel free to get me to restate parts of it as you go along. No, no, no. So I think I think you always talk about my kind of a personal experience and a bit about what we're doing at the sort of RSPC and a bit of a commentary on what, what that's meant for my career. I mean, so I remember working for Plymouth City Council, because as I said, when I was a student, I had no money. So I worked, I put myself for university and, and worked. And I remember someone coming into the office I worked in, making the most offensive homophobic joke um, possible. And it was just seen that was acceptable. No one questioned it. And everyone in the office, apart from me, laughed. And I thought, I just can't, I can't be in a place like this. So that was that, you know, you have sometimes those sort of turning point moments where you go, I'm not gonna that's not okay <laughs> and I thought from that point I was always just gonna be really out because then if people do have those views and people are entitled to their views to just not entitled to express that in a workplace they would know that they were talking about people like me so that was the sort of moment that I decided to be really open and I did face some homophobia early on in my career I had a a, a boss who just was really awkward about being one-to-one with me. He even had his wife in one of my one-to-ones once. That was really weird. <laughs> and they talked about my partner at the time as my as my friend. And I was like, it's not my friend, he's my lover. <laughs> and 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 so I did experience that. You know, what what I would say now is, you know, in some ways it's because I'm in a different position in the sector. But I do think that I think the sector has changed a lot over my 20-year career span. And, and I think those things still experience some homophobia even today I you know I had some homophobia recently in a bar and I was like oh that's what it used to be like you know you kind of forget that you know someone made a really horrible homophobic comment about me but they're they're rare now where I found the sector really welcome though is, is I do have personal experience of epilepsy and for much of my 20s I was still experiencing seizures and I worked for Scope, the disability charity at the time, who were really inclusive because that was impacting my day-to-day ability to be able to do the role. I was on a lot of medication, my immune system was compromised at the time as well and I was experiencing real fatigue and I was going through a lot of assessment work as well with clinicians and Scope was really inclusive around that. I've been seizure-free for a long time now but that was a, that was a sort of challenge in time personally that I I think if I hadn't had such an inclusive employer, could have been could have been more difficult. I mean, you would hope that Scope would do that, and they did. They were very welcoming, inclusive employer making adjustments. I think that the sector we're talking a lot about, you know, what our response from the cross diversity and inclusion is, and there's certainly some progress that we've made as well. But I've talked before about we're really good at coming up with nice policies and action plans, but it's really about action. And, and some of this stuff is challenging because we're, we're, we're complex organisations. We've got a whole range of stakeholders, whether it's membership or whether it's supporters who've got a vested interest or a stake in the organisation. And sometimes the, the kind of cause that you're working to is obviously the most important thing that you're looking at. But ED and I can seem to be kind of positive as inclusion can seem to competing with that. So for me, it is about how we really grip this, because if we want to be the best advocates for people whose needs are not being met by the state or not being met well and and provide those kind of important services we do that when we fill in the gaps between other whether it's business or whether it's it's government we've got to understand the communities in which we're working in and we've got to reflect them so there is a lot of work for us to do around that and the rspca we've undertaken a big review on equality diversity and inclusion it's a it's an important thing that we're championing at the moment we're about to recruit our first ever but we've recruited the individuals about to start our first ever head of equality diversity and inclusion and we're really looking at how we embed that across our employment practices but also how we engage with our supporters as well and um, so that's an important part of what we're looking at and um, so for me this is this is something that I'm very passionate about in my leadership as of the organization as one of the leaders in the sector as well because I've experienced it in my own life I've experienced that discrimination and I've experienced that being overlooked because of a protected characteristic and, and I just think that's not okay and it needs to change really. Did I answer your question though Alex? <laughs> you did I think you uh, I think you ticked off each of the points in it in fact yeah well done. <laughs> Chris can I ask you next about your work on innovation and service improvement how do you think about that maybe can you give us an example from one of the organizations you've worked at? You know, think about innovation service improvement. I, I remind myself of a speech that Matt Hyde, the chief executive of Scouts, gave to the Relay Federation a couple of years ago, 
where he talked about the, the need for charities today. Our vision is still pretty much kind of set in stone as organizations, what we're trying to achieve in terms of, of kind of the impact on society, but we need to find new ways to deliver our mission. And that for me is why I am passionate about innovation and service improvement, because you know it's a cliche, we live in a rapidly changing world and we do need to find new ways to reach our audiences and find new mediums to deliver service to our audiences. So it's a really interesting but challenging conversation because Relate's sort of service offer since its foundation in the 1930s have been what happens in a counselling room in person. And I remember that at a later conference having a conversation about mobile phones, digital technology was, was actually disrupting people's relationships. You know, people are finding their partners now increasingly online through apps like Tinder or Grindr or Hinge is the latest one. You know, mobile phones were becoming a mechanism to actually communicate with your partner. So the sort of messages through WhatsApp people are being sent every day and they're also a mechanism to cause challenges in relationships you know from horrible practices like installing snooping apps on your partner's phone through to checking your mobile phone and mobile phones become almost an extension of ourselves it's where we conduct a lot of our personal life you can find a partner order food and do your banking through your mobile phone so that's happening in our society but when it came to a conversation about actually maybe we need to find some means to deliver services online that was quite a challenging conversation for some of the therapists in the organization so there's an acceptance that you know technology is disrupting the way we find conduct and even end our relationships but trying to move that into a conversation about actually how do we look at delivering services differently was quite challenging. Relate had run a, a kind of live chat text-based counselling service, what was it, therapeutic rather than counselling, therapeutic-based chat-based service for a number of years. When we drilled into the data on that, and that's one of the things I really learned about innovation is really understand the position that you're, you, you're dealing with, was that that chat-based service was actually making connections with a different audience. So the kind of core audience for Relate's in-person couple counselling service have been 35 to 45 typically a middle class kind of middle income kind of household its online service was actually communicating with a much younger profile and a much more diverse profile in terms of people's socioeconomic background so for me that was learning about that innovation service improvement start with what are you trying to achieve the why who you're trying to reach and find different mechanisms to do that and and kind of you know have those conversations in the organization so I think I obviously left relate before the pandemic started but I could see as a kind of observer from the outside that that work and investing in that channel shift and being able to have multi-channel access to its services so counseling through video camera text-based services as well as kind of the in-person counseling put it in good stead as an organization for the disruption that happened during the pandemic so I think that kind of innovation is important the other thing I'm very passionate about because we're talking about impact is about really understanding the difference that you make and I think the agenda's moved on you know I think the days when you could do your happy sheets or just talk about the magic of your work you know is long gone we do live in a, an environment and it's only going to get tougher you can see that in what the chancellor's talked about this week around um, the the kind of um fiscal climate that we're going to be facing into as a country it's going to be pretty challenging particularly with some trends around climate change and the kind of aging population we're going to the, the country's going to face some difficult challenges being able to evidence the effectiveness of your interventions the difference you're making is really important so at relay we did roll out a kind of set of academically validated measures across all those counselling services to really be able to demonstrate the difference that relates counselling made for beneficiaries, for clients, rather than just rely on the magic of counselling. Now, obviously, in animal welfare, it's a different world. You know, I think providing an academic validated measure to a dog who's been rescued by the RSPC it might not go as well, but we are looking at different ways to do that. And we've talked about in our world about the five freedoms, so the, the right to have access to food for an animal. And we're now moving to what we're calling the five domains, which is a bit of a shift, which is really looking at the, the kind of mental health of animals. And we're really thinking about that in our work as well. So although it's a different client base, if I put that in inverted commas, we're really thinking about actually how do we have the best impact in a much more rounded way because I think animal welfare at times has sort of fallen into only looking at the physical health of an animal rather than its environment and rather than its its kind of mental well-being as well particularly if we recognize animals are sentient beings they can feel a range of different emotions like pain and pleasure we're, we're very much thinking about how we can look at that impact in our work as well so yeah it's 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 difficult to do that in these organizations that have been doing uh, what they've been doing for a very long time but that focus on service improvement and quality and, and really thinking about the difference you're making is really important but yeah it is a an interesting topic around impact and i think the 
the kind of conversation around impact has has also moved on in terms of moving beyond just impact measurement and kind of proving what you're doing to being more about understanding the difference you make of course but more about learning and evaluation and using that for continuous improvement improving rather than proving so i i mean there's still both types of models out there different funders and people looking at, at things in different ways but i think there's there's definitely that kind of shift and i think it's interesting your point about organizations that have been doing the same thing for a long time as well because i think they're the cases where it's most important to really do that work to to learn about what's work what's having the most impact and what's not and that often with organizations that have been around for a long time and doing the same thing for a long time inefficiencies creep in don't they and there's a bit of well well we couldn't ever stop doing that because we've always done that whereas actually some of that if you if you're doing some really good learning and evaluation you can you can really meet the needs of today in a better way than perhaps delivering the services you were doing 30 years ago i appreciate with um kind of rescuing dogs and cats and things it's a it's a little bit different to some of the other services that i might have in mind but um but yeah i think that's it i think i think you know the, the principles for me are are the kind of same how do you embark upon that sort of process of innovation and service improvement i mean i think first of all it's start with what's happening outside the external context i mean as a leader in the sector i i sort of started in the sector what 2002 2003 it's nearly 20 years ago now my goodness <laughs> i graduated 20 years ago this year and uh, that's blown by but you know we've been through i mean i started my career in the sort of you know those days of the economic boom at the end of the new labor government before the credit crunch hit but for most of my career, we've actually been in like quite difficult economic times. And also we've lived through the financial crisis. We've lived through the impact of Brexit, irrespective of what side of the debate you want. It was pretty fair to say it was a pretty difficult time in our country. We've lived through COVID and now we're in a kind of inflationary cost of living crisis in war in Europe. I mean, if you think about the sort of post-war period, there just hasn't been that kind of level of disruption in our economy and our society in the way that we sort of live through. So you have to start with, start with that external context. I think the second thing is you do you do need to engage professionals and it's getting professional therapists or inspectors in the RSPCA to be engaged with each other those professional conversations about change improvement need to happen I think the third thing is that when I think about innovation most innovation is kind of hidden in public services and charities people will find those ways to do things more effectively and more efficiently not always within the rules I remember um, evaluating a welfare to work service a few years ago when I worked I think it might be in a, a different charity I think it was Shore Trust and I remember interviewing this woman who was a a uh, welfare to work advisor in North Devon and her it was an ESF funded DWP funded so there were three different inspection regimes on this contract so it had European inspection DWP inspection and internal inspection by Shaw Trust and this woman really knew how to do her job and the idea was supposed to be one-to-one -one support between her as an advisor and, and kind of unemployed um, uh, individuals who were looking for support to work. Well, she'd worked out that model didn't really work because what she started with was some really good insights. And one of her insights was that people needed to be able to have somebody to call on their way to a job interview and somebody to pick up the phone to, to celebrate their success. And the second thing she, her second insight was that there needed to be moral support and dare I say, a bit of competition to each other. She'd worked out that people saying, well, they got a job and they joined the job club before me. So she actually, because she was in quite an isolated part of North Devon, she actually didn't do the model she was supposed to do. Actually, what she did was she formed a job club where people sat around the table rather than that one-to-one -one support. Because her third insight was actually, as an advisor, she actually had very little time one-to-one -one with, with individuals she was working with, whereas getting them together and building those relationships, there was a lot more time available to support people. So anyway, I'm, I'm kind of waffling on now. So she had done all of that. It's not what she was supposed to do. It was actually the right thing in terms of the implement of the intervention and, and her outcomes that she was trying to achieve. But actually, she was supposed to do a one-to-one -one model. And it took about two or three interviews to get to that. Mm. And that, for me, is what I sort of start with. You know, start with the insights you're getting in your service. Start with what's actually not being told in terms of that sort of hidden innovation and work with that really. And so, yeah, that's my insight. Start with the outside, find those insights, find those good people in the organization who are doing something interesting and, and explore that a bit more. And I suppose the other thing I've learned about is, is really understand the data that you're finding. You know, when I've got things wrong around innovation, it's because we've not really understood the 
picture that we're trying to sort of deal with really so yeah there's there's kind of lots to do we can do to innovate but it's yeah really starting with that kind of why you're here and what you're trying to achieve i was just thinking it's there's a point there around that term innovation because i think people often think they hear innovation they think maybe about some of the digital work they think about things needing to be kind of big shiny exciting new projects and things but actually there's that ongoing innovation all the time in the sector and it's as you say it's your project workers just thinking actually whatever it is that's not working we're doing this thing on a Wednesday morning and no one turns up and then you do it on a Thursday afternoon and and you have twice as many people like there were those little improvements that are also a type of in- innovation oh I know but as a sector we're really good at providing a bit too magic and mystery to to kind of our language you know I mean innovation inspires you know building a, a space rocket that's going to fly to the moon really and it's one of you know one of my sort of bugbears is you know that around the innovation world when I worked in it I worked for Nesta for three years was I remember coming up my, my bugbear was the word ideation which means to generate ideas and <laughs> ideation uh-huh. that sounds like something you need a cream for uh, yeah yeah visiting your GP <laughs> Um, and do you like you know do you mean like coming up with ideas and i just it's i'm i'm an offender of that at times as well as using some of that sort of management speak when we can be a bit more sort of plain english around things but it makes us sound a bit more impressive i think in our own heads and like we know a bit more than we actually do but it's really off-putting so that's can we ban the word alex ideation i hate that word <laughs> yeah yeah i'm happy to, happy not to use that one happy not to use innovation as well to be honest because it's a, it's a certainly one that's over you you mean like trying something new out a bit because that's all right <laughs> yeah yeah exactly we're probably all guilty of using more jargon than we think we do and certainly for consultants it's something that lots of lots of us are often very guilty of it's kind of like oh well from a consultant perspective we, we wholly endorse that of course more management speak yeah <laughs> Hey, uh, come up with uh, some really fancy sounding tools and frameworks to to double our face. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's another interesting point about language, actually, and coming back to the point around class in the sector as well. I was talking about with Ed Archer on the last episode, or the one before last, sorry, just about that. So we were talking in the context of, I don't know, have you seen the Reclaim report that came out recently about working class people in the sector or the lack of working class people in the sector? And one of the things was about the language being used and particularly around anti-poverty charities using language that working class people who are actually struggling with being on low incomes and so on, facing income inequality and things that they just, they don't recognise the terminology that's being used because it's not how they would talk about being brassic was the term that Ed used kind of this kind of language that we use that's a kind of like overly professionalized corporate style kind of speak for things that doesn't I suppose resonates with some people but doesn't it excludes parts of the population as well and often parts of the population that were the the causes that are used in that language are actually trying to reach and support uh, so, sorry, another tangent. There's no question in there. Just uh, <laughs> thought, thought I'd have a turn. <laughs> it, it's a well-trodden aspect of, of kind of charities that work with disabled people about the kind of, there's a, there's a great term there about nothing for us without us. And I think that mm. that professional knows best and doing to individuals or communities is just such a tired format. I mean, I spent quite a chunk of my career working around the idea of co-production. You know, it's a fairly management speaky term, but the, the principle behind it is about designing and delivering services with people. Things like patient support groups or healthy heart groups or expert patients program, they provide those forums for people to talk about their experiences. Having had a long-term health condition, you know, you do want to hear about what it's like for other people and being able to talk to other people with a similar experience to you is, is beneficial. So I think it's, it's a sort of still a mindset shift in the sector, but I think, again, that's an area where we've come a long way in terms of really embedding those principles about, you know, nothing for us without us and that sort of peer-to-peer support. You know, that's certainly, you know, I'm, I was working on that sort of 2008, 2009, when I was at Nesta and it, and it sort of shifted quite a long way. So, but yeah, so it's a well-trodden path, that one as well. Yeah, indeed. And funnily enough that was actually the kind of main topic of discussion was around co-production and and sharing power and that sort of thing Ed's the head of service design and delivery at Toynbee Hall who um, work in East London and uh, done some great work 
covered some really good stuff around kind of inclusive recruitment practice and stuff that they're doing there as well. Okay, I was going to segue into <laughs> another topic for us to tackle. So I wanted to ask you about organisational change. I know you've gone into chief exec roles at both Relate and RSPCA where there's been a need for some change and so it'd be great to hear about the kind of model of change you've used and, and a bit of kind of illustration of how how you've used that in practice so there that's a really good question yeah I mean I've I've I mean, I'm really lucky in my career to have worked at some amazing organizations and I really love the RSPCA our country is better because of the RSPCA and we'd be poorer without it and similarly with Relate I mean animal welfare and relationships are two of the things that are most important to us but both have been august organizations that have needed to face up to some some difficult challenges so you asked about what's my sort of model of change well i'm i'm a big fan of john cotter it's a model of change and um, so he talks about building your coalitions of, of support um, but there's a big bit in John Cotter's model that I really don't like, and I learned the hard way, which is John Cotter talks about building the burning platform. And I think in social purpose organisations like charities, that's really tricky when you come in and you talk about this isn't good enough or this needs to change. I remember doing that. And sorry, Chris, just for people that aren't familiar with Cotter's work, what's the burn in the building, sorry, building the burning platform? So he, his idea to be able to create the incentive for change is that you identify a burning platform. So you need to identify something in the organisation that's broken, not working, that incentivizes people to be able to come on a journey with you with change. And what I've found in charities is if you go in and say, this is broken, this isn't going to work, it doesn't tend to go so well. <laughs> and I remember doing this at Relate in a kind of meeting in Birmingham and this amazing centre director just turned to me and said, how dare you? I've been in this organisation for 20 years and you come in here and tell me this bit of the organisation is broken and isn't fit for purpose. So I'm not a fan of that bit of it. But what I am a fan of is, you know, he then talks about, so you identify your burning platform, why you need to change. You know, I think in Social Purpose Organisation Charity, there's a book about how it's actually much harder to do that because really it's focusing on what could the future look like? What could that vision for the future look like? And trying to paint a picture for that for people about what it might look and feel like for them rather than starting with this doesn't work, you know, it's not fit for purpose. That can be quite difficult. So talking about that kind of good to great. The second bit he talks about is then about building your coalition for change. Your, you know, how do you build that movement of people in an organisation who are on board? And that, I think, is really important in social purpose organisation because, you know, people work at the RSPC, people work to relate because they're really passionate about the organisation. There's a lot of them in, in the room. It's not a dispassionate conversation in a very logical way. You're dealing with logic and emotion and you have to recognise that, I think, when you're dealing with change. So building that coalition. And I think the other thing is, is just being pragmatic and not too fixed on things as well. So for me, you're fixed on where you want to get to, but how you get there, you might find some different ways to do it. Now, that played out at the RSPCA around our governance as well. And I think most people in the sector have read an article about the RSPCA and challenges around its governance. You know, we hadn't reformed our governance seriously uh, for about 45 years when I came in as chief exec, and we had been under close scrutiny by the Charity Commission and also we had, you know, received an official warning, one of the new powers of the commission over our governance. We were not in a great place. Now, the, the sort of starting point for me was really understanding where people were coming from. So why was there resistance to change? What was that really about? Rather than coming in and going, this is really terrible because people have done that before and that hadn't gone so well. I think people generally knew it needed to change and coming in and telling them might make me feel better and going, this is terrible, but actually doesn't really move the conversation forward. So it started with, What's that future look like? What could this be like if we get it right? And then building a coalition of people around the council and then in our membership who were up for that change, really. So that's what I mean by that kind of burning platform doesn't always work well. And I think for me, I know that change is working well when people play it back to you, when people are talking about some of the messages you're saying, so you don't be the only one who's saying it. So my, my mentor at the time used to talk about my kind of style of, of kind of delivering change wasn't to be the one who's up front. They follow me. It was to almost be kind of alongside people and sort of nudging it forward. I think if it's all about the chief exec or all about you as the leader, you become sort of too bound up with it, really. It's about how does that become owned and embedded across the organisation, where they're coming from. And I think the other thing about sort of charities is really understand the history of where the organisations come from uh, uh, and really 
dig into that a bit really to help you understand where you might go so i think we we got the governance changes through in the rspca and it's a long time coming but i can i think that's the other thing about talking about those governance changes was no one really well a couple of us i actually do really like the governance and a bit nerdy on it but a lot of people don't get excited about it but it's governance for a purpose so why reform your governance and for me it was about actually the rspc has got such a vital role around rescuing caring for animals who've experienced neglect and cruelty we need to be in the best possible position to do it, and that's why we need good governance and i can see that playing out now in the organization we've moved beyond that challenging times of deficit budgets and financial challenges into one which is about investing in our future um, and that's what our governance changes delivered so it's that what is the purpose of that change because again people who in the organization support the organization have got a stake in its future and want to see it do well and and you know seeing how that's playing out has, has been really important for that and was the, those governance changes was that about the board or was that about the kind of relationship between the national and local aspects of the RSPCA? Both, both. So we had a, a council of 28, 20, so three were co-opted, 10 were elected by the branch network and 15 elected by the membership. We had no term limits and that that was just too big really. Um, so what we moved to was a board of 12, of whom nine are elected by the membership. We have term limits of nine years, so trustees can serve three terms of three. Uh, we have three co-opted members and we also created a new branch affairs committee to oversee the relationship because the RSPC is a federated charity. So we have 143 independent branches and that branch affairs committee is made up of 10 um, regional, in the case of Wales, a, a national chair who represent the branches within our governance. So it was important that the branch network is heard in our governance because they're a really vital part of our animal welfare work that we do. They're responsible for 80% of our rehoming work for, for pets. And so we wanted to make sure they had a voice within our governance. That's quite a big change for us from a council of 28 to a board of trustees of 12 and a new relationship with our, our branch network. So, but I can, as I said, I can see that the, the impact that's had. And we're now in a conversation with our branch network about a modernization of their governance framework as well. So, you know, these things never quite end. We're on to sort of phase two of that work as we speak. Oh yeah, it certainly adds a whole heap more complexity having all those kind of different elements of structure doesn't it with different branches and membership and so on yeah but i love that i love that about the rspca i love the fact the thing about our branch network is it, it what it brings is real local passion and understanding more volunteers more understanding of the communities in which we operate in but as a chief executive a federated charity it does make it a bit more challenging you know <laughs> you certainly that you can't just say this is the way we're going for it and on you get on it's a there's a lot more engagement and discussion but when we move in a particular direction we really move so yeah so it adds a bit more complexity and thinking about that when you're developing strategy because i think you've you've been doing this quite recently haven't you uh, like what's the sort of process how do you involve those different parts of the organization the branches and staff and volunteers and committee members and so on well i think i think a, a trustee of mine at relay used uh, did a sort of mentoring piece with me where he showed me this um diagram and he talked about a set of scales and he talked about one side of the scale is the why and the other side is the how and the point he was making is that a lot of charities get sort of lost because they just start with the how rather than why. So why are we doing this? Why are we here? Where are we going? Think that starting with that kind of conversation, you know, what, what's working well, what's not working so well, why do we need to change? Why are we here? What impact are we trying to achieve? Starting with that rather than going into the how, I think is quite important. So you actually kind of co-create what the problem you're trying to solve is and being clear about a shared vision about where you're trying to go to. That might sound a bit academic, but I think you listen in kind of exec meetings or trustee boards, quite a lot of the conversation can be in the how. So we're going to do it in this way rather than the why. So that's the sort of first bit that I've learned about is that kind of scale. And the thing is, actually, if you think about an organisation, it's really the exec and the trustees who will be doing that why conversation. So why are we going in a particular direction and, and what vision are we trying to, to achieve really with the organisation? So I think there's a bit about that. I think the other thing is don't try and force the conversation too much. So start with that why, where are we going? And then that leads naturally into the kind of how you're going to get there and what you're going to do. So structuring that conversation a bit and I think the RSPCA, how we developed our strategy was we did do, we did a pack for um, all different departments in the organisation and for the branch network to be able to, to have conversations about where we're going. We didn't invent that ourselves. We actually 
plagiarized shelters pack, which Polly Neat was very happy to lend me. I think sometimes you don't have to reinvent the wheel and think it has to be your solution. So we copied shelters model and Polly was really generous to say where some things didn't go so well for her with her strategy development. And we, we learned from that. And then the other thing we did was we pulled together five what we call cross-organizational workshops where we got 20 people from different departments. We really wanted to stimulate that interdepartmental conversation and with the branch network, and we had a sort of set of questions. Sorry, Chris, to interrupt you, but just so that pack that you sent round, was that that was to help branches and other departments to discuss the the why and the kind of strategic direction. And then when you had those big workshop type sessions, then they could people would come with what they'd already discussed and then feed into it in that way. And we tested some of that thinking. So in that pack, we had a couple of very open-ended questions about the sort of future. And then we also put on the table what we called a set of givens. So rather than having a blank canvas, we said these things we think are really important in the future, like our inspector and our investigatory work is really important part of our future. So we put those on the table as, as kind of lead to say this is what we think is important. So yeah, all that feedback, I think we had about 90 responses from departments and branches. And then we had those five cross-organizational workshops to basically test some of that thinking. And that really helped to generate our strategy. And then with our kind of senior leadership group, it got a bit, the whole process got a bit distorted by COVID because we went into lockdown. We were planning to do a sort of second set of roadshows to test some of the strategic thinking that didn't quite happen. So we had to adapt and we did a kind of process of engagement with our senior leaders on developing the strategy. So that's kind of where it came from really was a much more open collaborative process. And again, the ISPC was really new, I think because of our governance challenges in the past, strategies have been kind of written in the council and then sort of published on the website and for me this the sort of test of strategy was it had to be sticky it needed to be embedded across the organization and it is a lot more than it would have been I mean it's still always more you can do but we talk about the strategy in the organization there's a general sense of what our priorities are and it's a talking point in the organization in a way that it wasn't before so that's kind of how we did that really I think an important thing I've learned about kind of service improvement and innovation and sort of strategy development is it is it's really helpful to have some uh, informal support outside. So you've got, you know, fortunate enough to have a, access to a good network of other sort of CEOs and, and kind of key individuals to test ideas out. And also because I'm on your podcast, you know, we have engaged consultants. You know, obviously we've got a bigger budget to do that in a larger charity, but having that independent view and having some external support can be helpful to basically, I don't, I don't think you have to invent the wheel from scratch. I think there is learning from others. And certainly at the RSPC, there was quite a lot when I joined about we're entirely unique and I'm going well we have branches that's not unique other charities they're unincorporated well that's not unique we have an inspectorate it might be unique in England and Wales but the Scottish Society the Northern Ireland Society the Australian Society they have inspectors too so can we learn from others so yeah having some external support plugging you a bit but having external support can help <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you <laughs> obviously consultants can help in all different ways and even just in the strategy process people can use external support for kind of different bits how did you use that external support what sort of role did they play was it facilitation or kind of sounding boards or a bit of everything all of the above really helped us build the engagement plan stakeholder engagement on the governance change in our strategy sounding board i worked with um, somebody recently retired caroline copeman at bays who helped us develop the process helped to develop the consultation pack also provided a bit of a sounding board on the findings because sometimes not that we would do it of course in your SPCA you can you can listen to what you want to listen to from your feedback and having someone who's a bit independent to make sure you're actually really hearing what people were saying so yeah we we use Caroline from Bayes quite a lot in our go for governance changes and our strategy development and and so yeah so that's that's how it worked for us really Alex. I think often it's that sort of independent slightly removed kind of view of things and and voice isn't it that's most helpful because it's not like you couldn't do those things yourselves and certainly at, at a larger organization you've got the capacity in-house to kind of spend the time developing the process and doing doing some of those things yourselves but as you say sometimes you just you need someone that's a little bit further away from everything to, to kind of take a look at things as well Chris one of the things that's really impressive about your career is just how much you've done and the level you've reached in a relatively short time. So you're only, what, 40-ish years old. You're on your, your chief exec of one of the kind of biggest, most well-known charities in the country. Done some great work at those other organisations. So, I mean, 
it'd be interesting to hear how any reflections you've got on how you how you've maybe kind of made some of the bigger steps up in in that process of your career or any thoughts on how you've managed to kind of be that be as successful as you have been and then anything that you would share with people in terms of advice any career advice for people oh wow it's very nice of you to say but i don't think that that kind of uh, you you painted me in a, a much better light than i paint myself there but it's very nice of you to say so what, what advice would i give i mean i you know I, I mentioned mentoring at the beginning of the interview you know i'm a really big fan of mentors I think i was uh, fortunate enough to get ahead in my career because i've, I've been able to reflect on what I've done, what's gone well, and also what hasn't gone so well. So, you know, one of my questions to my mentors is often, you know, what's my blind spot? What am I missing? And really sort of taking this opportunity to reflect in a kind of relatively safe space about what hasn't gone so well. So I'm a real big fan of mentoring. I've been fortunate enough, probably on, I think, three occasions now, to access management development training. You know, I still use some of the tools. I still remember the BOF method about how you give back and um, kind of uh, constructive feedback to somebody, talk about the behaviours. I don't. I don't think I've come across that one. What's the What's the boff? Oh, I love it. This from um, the boff moment. You talk about the behaviour you've seen, the outcome you'd like to see, and um, the, the, the behaviour you've seen, the outcome it's had for you, how you feel about it, and in the future you'd like to see something else. And I still use that method and have to have a, a sort of more challenging conversation with somebody. And I learned that on a management development program when I was at Relay, actually, and I did a similar program at Scope years ago. So I think hoovering up those opportunities, I think as a sector, because particularly our funding can be a bit more kind of a stop-start, particularly with project funding, those things are harder to invest in, but they are important. And I think they've been important for me in terms of my my career development. And uh, networking, I'm in a few networks as a, you know, both as a chief exec and when I was a director. And so that that's been important as well, um, to be to be kind of building those networks because again, we're still learning from other organisations. We're often grappling with similar challenges and approach them from a sort of slightly different way. So that networking opportunity and being able to come compare notes is really important. So yeah, mentoring, professional development, and and networking. I think professional development can often get you know it's very difficult to prioritise that with the burning e- inbox and all the challenges you've got in your day to day. But it is important to carve that time out for itself. I mean, I was fortunate enough to do a professional management qualification when I became chief executive relate. Uh, and that for me, it was really hard to find the time to do that. But I have no regrets in doing that. It's really set me up to be, you know, to really understand how corporate governance works and and kind of how strategy development works. And, and that was a diploma in company direction from Salford University. And that was a really good, I mean, it's a very expensive qualification, but doing something at that point mid-career was really, really helpful and beneficial to me. So I, I also, you know, now in my role, I do things like these podcasts because I think it's a great, op- it's, it's, it's obviously great to talk about your organisation and what you've done. But the thing I find really valuable about it is you actually go, oh, what, what have I learned about? What do I think about that? get you to reflect on your your kind of practice so I think I think that's what's kind of been important for me really there's another part of your question which I've now forgotten but oh yeah (laughs) Uh (laughs) go for it (laughs) yeah I I can't remember the initial bit I can't remember the exact question but I've got some follow-up questions anyway so in terms of the courses I mean I think as you say the there's a challenge around prioritizing learning and development and I, I think one of the things as well is like knowing what's worth investing that time and money in as well because we've all gone to training and conferences and things that have been a complete waste of time and money so i was going to ask you about specifics so you mentioned the diploma there and then are are there any other ones any other kind of particular courses or qualifications or anything like that that you'd particularly recommend so i think the there's definitely the diploma in company direction which is institute directors and it was through software university i did it bays runs some really good kind of qualifications that they do a really good inspiring leaders program as well because I think the what have I found I found the the jump from head of to director really challenging because you go from a head of you're a sort of specialist in your knowledge and going to that director you've got that broader remit and you can't be the expert in everything and I think the director to chief exec is probably a is a bigger jump you know people ask me what was it like going from a small charity like Relay or relatively small you know I think the group is about 27 million when I was chief exec to 180 million pound group of the RSPCA that jump was actually less 
than the jump from being director of policy and external affairs to being chief exec. And it was also, you've got to reassure a board of trustees. Now, I sort of talk about the sort of swan metaphor that you, everyone expects you to know the answer and you have to look like you're calm and poised, but your kind of feet are going below the table going, I haven't got a clue what to do, don't know. <laughs> you're supposed to know the answer to this one. It's that sort of jump. I think the other thing about the director to chief exec is that when you're a director, you have your moments in the spotlight. Um, to keep politics and affairs, you know, they manifesto for election campaign or an event or a new report or a big press release or a crisis comms piece, and then it goes a bit quieter. It's never quiet with the chief exec. You know, there's always something going on in different parts of the organisation, and that's being able to spin plates is kind of tricky. And where do you spend your time? And that people watching you to see what messages you're sending out. So it, it is a bigger jump, I think, from the director to the chief exec. So you asked about, so the Bays do some good stuff. I've done a couple of the civil society programmes as well. And Dorothy Dalton does a really good understanding governance course that I highly sort of recommend as well. And I've also done their Zoe Amars, who's brilliant, who does a really good course on sort of digital and, and kind of charity governance as well. So yeah, I think it's it's just finding that time. It's easy to kind of push that to one side. And, and then also I became a fellow of St. George's House at Windsor. They're running a really good leadership fellow leadership fellow program. Um, and I really like that they use a different learning style. So it's much less about directive learning. It's about sort of sharing experiences. And I've had, I've been on some really powerful programs from them as well, which I, which I highly recommend as well, if you're fortunate enough to get involved in that kind of program. So it's just finding what works for you really. I'm, I'm not familiar. Who are the, who's that? Who's the organisation? So St George's House was, yeah, it's set up by Prince Philip and it's in Windsor Castle. It's set up by the Duke of Edinburgh as a kind of space for reflection on kind of national conversations. So Relate, we did a couple of consultations with them on sort of, you know, relationships in society. A few years ago, they set up a leadership programme and they have about 250 fellows. And what I like about their fellowship model is it doesn't just focus on charity leaders. It's also got commercial and public sector leaders as well. And that kind of, actually, as charity leaders, we don't really get much opportunity to talk to people from the private sector or public sector. We're diff- grappling with different issues, but I've been really struck by some of the similarities. And I think the best consultation I went to, I went to had a senior leader from the NHS and a senior leader from a commercial company. And I learned so much on that program. It was such a such a great investment of 24 hours in that program. So, uh, you know, you know, Alex, I've talked a lot about I'm a real big fan of that personal development, but finding opportunities to meet with people from different sectors they are a bit rarer to find and then the other thing is do occasionally go to conferences as well and kind of learn from others really so yeah I think it's just finding those mechanisms that work for you but that I think that networking with people in your sector and finding opportunities to meet with people from other sectors has probably been one of the most powerful things when you're comparing notes and what other people are grappling with and you mentioned coaching earlier on as well I think so you've mentioned mentoring and coaching and is that are you using those interchangeably at all? Are they two completely separate things that you've got kind of voluntary mentors and then you've got coaching that you, you've you had as part of a role that's been paid for? I think it's three, actually. There's, there's the kind of, I do have an informal mentor at the moment and I'm really enjoying that. He's a bit more experienced in his career and it's a really good sounding board. I had kind of paid for mentor and I'm now trying out working with a coach. And I was always a bit resistant to working with a coach. Obviously mentoring, coaching and different. Coaching is a facilitator style for you to be able to kind of work through problems whereas a mentor is someone saying I don't think you should do that and you should do it this way and I probably do tend to to kind of gravitate towards the mentoring because I kind of not always good at reading between the lines and kind of just like, tell me what to do, you know. <laughs> but I'm really enjoying the kind of coaching. Like, I, I think the thing in this conversation is I recognise I'm really privileged. I'm the chief executive of a large charity. I get access to that. But I've also worked in small charities as well. I haven't always worked in, I've worked in hand-to-mouth small charities with a dozen people in one charity I work with. And there's still ways you can find those mentors that that charity I worked in, it was a sort of a disabled people's organisation. And my boss was a really good mentor. I learned so much from working from her, but I went into that conversation prepared, like with some topics to talk about, really thinking about what I wanted to try and get out of it. And almost that kind of implicit contract about what I'm talking about. So yeah. I don't think it just, I don't think you get access to things just because I'm in a privileged position of being the chief executive of the RSPCA. I think there are ways to find that opportunity. But what I've learned about that is, is making sure you're really making use of it. You just turn up and go, I don't even know what I'm going to talk about. 
don't really get much value out of it. It's, it's really thinking about what do I want to get out of this session? And sometimes yeah. you know, my last mentoring session was not what I expected to talk about. That was a bit of a surprise, but I just went in there open-minded and, and prepared to not be defensive and, and kind of really think about it. And I learned some stuff about myself from that conversation. And I used that learning in, in, in the job, really. So it's just, yeah, finding those opportunities to do that. Yeah, definitely. And the thing is, don't, don't be afraid to ask. I mean, uh, some people... I've, I've been mentoring someone recently who sort of reached out to me and I was delighted to do it. I really, personally, I've really enjoyed mentoring that individual. I've got a lot of value out of it. And equally, I've reached out to him and my current mentor was someone I went, you mentor me. <laughs> Want to talk about these things? You up for that? And buy you a coffee and you grab an hour once every couple of months and sort of chew the fat, really. Yeah, I think it's something people gen- generally tend to enjoy doing and are happy to be flattered to be asked and happy to do it and that sort of thing. And obviously if they can't commit the time they'll they can tell you but generally they do and i think it's something particularly in our sector that we we're we're able to network in a way that sometimes maybe in the private sector people can't so much when there's a you can network with your kind of competitor organizations if you like in our sector in a way that you couldn't in a, in a sort of commercial sector where it's a much more kind of competitive situation. I think the other thing there is, is I'm, I'm somebody who tries to be honest about some of the challenges. You know, one of the things that people sort of say back to me is I don't try and like pretend it's sort of slightly different. I tend to try and be a bit honest about these things really. So yeah, I think it is that kind of, if you give in, you're going to get something out. I think is what I'm trying to say. So what you invest in, if you're talking about the challenges you're facing or what you're dealing with, you're more likely to get kind of more back out of that conversation. Yeah, yeah. Um, noted a couple of things I wanted to ask you, and I, I realise uh, as you were speaking just before, and I realised one of the things was the other bit of the question that we couldn't remember <laughs> earlier. I think what I'd mentioned before was what were maybe some of the things that had helped you to make some of those kind of leaps forward in your career, coach, you know, thinking of stepping up to the CEO level. And then uh, as we were talking then, it, it just came back to me thinking about what was it First of all, at, at Relate, the, how did you convince the board to give you a, a shot in your first chief exec role? And then and then at RSBCA, you know, how to, I mean, I, I guess you had that experience from Relate, which is a decent size organisation and it's got that group structure. But again, what, what were some of the, the things that you thought about in terms of how am I going to make this step forward? How am I going to pitch myself and, and get this role? So I think the first question you asked there was about what sort of helped me on my career. So on that management program, actually, the management development program I talked about, the, the Salford University, we did this really interesting exercise where we talked about a coaching model about when did you feel in your comfort zone? When did you feel really uncomfortable? And when did you, they use the term flip out, I don't particularly like the term, where do you feel like super uncomfortable? And it was really interesting that everyone around the table described an example of where they'd done a, a project or had moved into a role where it just felt outside their comfort zone. So I talked about the move from scope, where I'd been a kind of business development uh, manager and run a kind of some equality, diversity, and inclusion projects to Nesta, which on paper and actually in experience was quite a different culture, a very different environment, going from a service delivery campaigning charity to a kind of public body that was a, in one of those horrible words, think and do tank. And I felt really uncomfortable when I arrived there because I just didn't know what the measures of success were or what the ways of working. And it was a very different, I'd gone from Scope, which was quite a loud organisation, like, you know, there's always noise in the office to a very much more kind of, you know, sombre organisation that was much more studious. And you know, I'm quite a gregarious, sociable person. No one was chatting to anybody when you sat around the table. <laughs> and it took me a while to work it out, but I grew so much in my career. So you probably would have maybe picked up for my CV. I've worked in different sectors and done different roles because I didn't sort of start as a comms officer, comms manager, head of comms. I did deliberately some different roles. I've worked in business development, I've worked in operations, I've worked in communications because that moving around a bit, I found a bit uncomfortable at times, but I think it's what's helped me to grow a bit more. And perhaps as a sector, I think we should be less focused on that kind of linear route and actually think about how you build up some experience in different parts of the organisation, which can be helpful. So that, that definitely was, was helpful. You asked about Relate. Well, I did the absolutely wrong thing. <laughs> I forgot about this. <laughs> so at the time when, when Ruth Sutherland, who's an amazing mentor for me, and I think she's a fabulous chief exec, stepped down, and um, the chair at the time sounded me out about the role, and I went, oh, I can't do that. Nah, I can't do that, mate. No, nah, no, nah, why are you asking me this question? And I was like totally gave him the emotional response going nah it's not for me I can never be a chief exec no and, and Andrew at the time was sort of sounding me out and I was like oh why did you say that 
<laughs> and I think the, the sort of, it, I think an internal appointment is challenging because you get a less. So I've been obviously director of communications and moving into the chief exec role. Part of my challenge there was actually. I did a lot more than be director of communications. I was involved in a whole load of different areas of the organization, but they knew me in the organization as the director of policy and external affairs. So it's almost like educating the board, but actually I do a sort of slightly different role here. And I've got a life before Relay and there'll be a life after Relay. So there's a bit of a kind of, a, a bit about that really. And yeah, not telling the chair at the time that I thought that appointing me to do things like, would be a terrible idea and I couldn't possibly do the job. I had to do a bit of unwinding of that one as well. <laughs> Yeah, when I when I applied for the RSPCA, I, I got approached by the headhunters to do it. I never expected to be offered the role. Um, and I was genuinely sort of surprised when I kind of got through the recruitment process, but also incredibly delighted. It's an organization I've long admired. And now I start to pinch myself and go, oh my goodness me, I'm the chief executive of the RSPCA because it's such a fabulous organization. But I, I never kind of go to these roles because I've got some big master plan. I just want to do things that are interesting, that I find stimulating, that I feel that my skills will add value. I'm very focused on how do you make the organization the best possible place to deliver its mission and vision and yeah wanting to kind of really deliver more of that kind of good society so yeah I kind of am more interested in I, I didn't want to be a chief exec just because of the status of being a chief exec I wanted to be a chief exec for what you could do with it really and that's another thing I give a bit of counsel to people on and I had a mentor who saying that to me when I applied for the relate job was don't tell them why you can be chief exec tell them what you're going to do with that role why why, what can you, what impact can you have for you? And that was really good advice. Because I think if you're going for it for the status, because you feel it's a privileged position or you've got power, it's probably the wrong reason. It's what, what can you do with that office really to, to advance your organization's mission and vision? Yeah, well, it comes back to that why versus how again, doesn't it? You know, focus on the why rather than the how. Yeah. And it's funny how we kind of, we all know that and we'll think about that when it comes to like, developing a strategy but then in another context we might completely forget about it in that communicating in an interview for example one other question that came to me just as you're talking a moment ago when you talked about the swan analogy where you're paddling like crazy under the water <laughs> yeah the question that came to me was when do you think it's you need to do the swan kind of image and present like everything's fine i'm, I'm in control and when is it the right time to maybe say actually I don't know what I'm doing or not to phrase it like that, but to say, actually, there's a lot going on here and I don't have all the answers and more than anyone else does. Cause there were those, I think you can do both of those things in chief exec positions. So is, and leadership positions. It, do you think there's, is there a kind of timing element to it where your team need one or the other at different times, perhaps? I think, I think that I probably come in a sort of slightly different way. It's a really interesting question. Alex. I think I come in a slightly different way, which is, it's kind of knowing when to ask for help and knowing when you don't know the answer or when you need to sort of check something out with somebody else. And I don't always get that right, but I try, you know, I'll talk to, in fact, it's actually Ruth, um, ex-CEO of Samaritans, talked about having the sort of, who have you got on speed dial? So who can you pick up the phone to and go, can I just run this past you and have a chat about this? And and being prepared to do that. So that's probably more what I would do is if I'm unsure about something, I know I had something that was proposed to me in the organization recently, and it was not my area of expertise, but I did know a chief exec who knew a lot more about that. And I met him for a coffee and ran it past him. And that was really helpful. So I think it's a bit about more about kind of being able to pick up the phone and sort of test these things out. It's not like checking up on your team, but it's going, hey, can I just chat about this with you? And, and sometimes people will do that with me as well. And I'm a big fan of you wanting from other people. So make sure you give back to others who ask for your help or just want to sort of be a sounding board for you. So I think it's more about that, really. I think the other thing is, as I've matured as a chief exec, and I've talked about this in a recent interview, is I think it's probably a bit more about me when I first became a chief exec and my ideas. And I think I've learned about, it's not about me, it's about we. And that sounds a bit cliche, but really trying to be a leader of leaders. I don't want to be a pedestal chief exec. I have all the answers to everything. And one of the messages I say with my team is, if I'm making a decision, it's probably an example of organisational failure. This should be about us making decisions. And I'm only making a decision when we can't agree. And sometimes you have to do that as a chief executive. But I think probably earlier on as a sort of CEO, particularly as it relates, it was more about me making the decisions. And I think I've definitely shifted on that dynamic as I've matured. It's about me to we. And um, so my, my chair will talk about when he was asked by, and um, when he was a chief exec by his chair, how's the team doing? He talked about how they were all getting on with him 
what the chair was saying, it's not about how they're getting on with you, it's about how they're getting on with each other. And I've really taken that to heart about how do you create a team that's not all about all coming to you. I think I'm, I know when I work well is when I work as part of a team. One of the things that will really sap my morale is politics in a team and kind of backbiting and criticising each other and that kind of whispering about each other from behind the, the sort of, you know, whatever that metaphor is. I, I don't work well. I don't function well in those teams. I need to feel part of a team. And so trying to craft that really is a sort of chief exec. And I haven't always got that right, but that's thing I focus in on is how do you get that team working well as a team, really? Because I think if you are working in that club, it doesn't mean always agree with each other. That's a great thing about a good team is you should be able to disagree. But I think you're much more powerful and be able to take an organisation forward if you are working collaboratively. Because there's only one of me. I don't know the answer to everything. And, and there's some things I know quite a bit about. And there's a whole load of things I know absolutely nothing about. So And, and I don't have that ego that I should know I do I can be a bit annoying with to work with some things I like to understand things but that's because I'm a position of intellectual curiosity I like learning I'm like, oh I didn't know about that that's fascinating so I learned some interesting stuff this morning at a meeting I was in I won't tell you about now but yeah you know I, I like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'm mindful we're coming up towards uh, running out of time it's been huge fun chatting to you i'm sure there's lots of interesting stuff that i'm going to listen back to make some notes on i will pull together some links to some of those resources some of those training courses and things like that that you mentioned put those on the web page so people can find that is there anything you'd like to say before we wrap up any any sort of messages for the audience any any asks of people in the sector anything at all I mean, I, th- I think it's just uh, to say a big thank you to you for, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today. It's been a real pleasure to kind of reflect on quite a wide range of issues. And I think if, if your listeners take anything about it, it is about look outside your organisation, reach out to other networks, find yourself a mentor, learn from others, really. That's, that's really, you know, if there's any sort of advice about what's helped me in my career, it's about starting with, I don't know the answer to this, but I'm going to find someone that does and is going to help me think this question through really. So that's, that would be my sort of top tip for you is if you want one is mentoring and reaching out to other networks to, to kind of help you find those answers would be my sort of top tip. But no, thanks Alex for the opportunity. Great. No, thanks very much, Chris. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Charity Impact Podcast and thank you for listening all the way to the end. Just one more thing before you go. If you listen to the podcast, I'd love to hear what you think. You can either leave a review on Spotify, Apple, etc., or tag me in a post on LinkedIn or Twitter at alexblake underscore K-E-D-A, or just drop me an email. For details on all episodes with notes and links to resources, head to our website, kedaconsulting.co.uk. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, take care.